my name is Alexandre Bergeron, as you just heard. I'm a back-end developer working at Wadzam, uh, mostly in Scala, but uh, as, I, I'm, as I'm saying in my next slide, uh, I've started coding in Python in 2007, actually, so it's one of my first few programming languages, and at, that, at the time it was one of my favorite. And now it's basically one in my top two with Scala, so, uh, and because I found that even true Scala is a statically typed language, both of them share a lot of similarities, like, as you can see in my next slide. Uh, well, basically, Scala compared to Python is a statically typed language, but both of them are object-oriented, functional uh, and imperative hybrid languages that you can use to make, can, kind of mix and match some, some programming styles. So use a more functional approach when uh, it's appropriate and use a more imperative approach. So it's, let's say, as an example, if you want more performance or if you want to write something that's more imperative. It compiles to the Java virtual machine, so you can usually, pretty easily call any uh, Java libraries from this. It has type <coughs> inference, so basically uh, when you're writing a, a value or variable, it will try to extrapolate the type from what is, what is being assigned to it. So you won't have to explicitly uh, specify the types as, as often as like languages like Java. And also it's built from, for concurrency. So uh, in the basis libraries, you've already got uh, parallel collections and asynchronous futures, which kind of looks like, uh, I think, uh, futures in Java, except that they, they actually have a callback and they compose with each other and actually work. And in the next version, there'll be like async await kind of like uh, will be coming to Python, I think the next version in 3.4, I think. And uh, also from c uh, f -sharp, so yeah. I'm going to start with some pretty basic stuff that basically is shared with any uh, programming language, most programming languages I know. So basically, uh, values and variables, well, there's two kinds of variables in Python. There's, there's some mutable variables, so let's say in that case, the mutable variable which is assigned to test. You can assign another value to it at any time. It, it, the state could, could always change with a new value. And you've also got some uh, val that are immutable. That means that once you assign a value to it, it will never change. And also, as you can see, I'm, I'm not specifying that mutable variable is a string. I'm not specifying that immutable variable is an int. It's being uh, ex uh, inferred by the compiler. And also, uh, I put some demo of a Java array because most languages have, have array, except that in Scala, since it's uh, mostly oriented as a, a, a functional imperative hybrid, we don't really use arrays because they're mostly mutable and they're, they, you don't really have control over the, 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 what is, what's the array content because it can leak into other parts of your code. If I can continue with some uh, basic control statements, you've got a, uh, an if condition, which basically looks, uh, looks like uh, everything you're doing in, in, Zav, uh, in Zavo. But you can write it on, uh, as a one-liner, and you can even return uh, a value from it like it's uh, basically like, uh, I think, a ternary operator in like C uh, languages. I haven't put brackets here because they're optional. Uh, I could have put brackets here or, or not. It's, it's, it's as you want. And we also got some uh, a try catch block. Uh, the, basically, a case E is just to match any kind of exceptions that happen here. Uh, still, since it's mostly oriented to uh, push you forward towards uh, functional programming, we, you won't use uh, try catch blocks that often. So. If I need to, cut, I want to cut, let's continue with a while loop, which basically looks like every while loop you've seen. There's also a do while loop. Uh, I haven't put, put it, but it's pretty similar to what you've already seen, maybe in Java or in Python. And you've got a for loop here, except that uh, compared to all these control statements, for loop is not a, really a statement, but it's mostly syntactic sugar for a call and collections. Like in that case, you're, you're iterating for, for all values in a range from one to five, but actually you're, you're calling four reads on that range, passing it as an anonymous, func uh, anonymous function, and that's how it's being inferred by from the four compilers. So basically, you've got a for loop, but it's mostly syntactic sugar, and it's even more powerful than that. This, as we'll see in, uh, further in the slides. Uh, also, uh, since it's mostly a functional programming language, you need to declare some functions. So basically, you declare this with, declare this with the def keyword, like in Python, by, as an example. Uh, here, uh, so it, uh, that function takes two parameters, x and y, both of them are int. 
and it returns an int. Uh, I've, set, I've put it directly here just to, so you, that you can also specify uh, the, the, the value. And I've implemented on one line, it's basically just x times, just a fun, it's just a simple function multiplying two values here. Uh, you can call it like that. You got a, uh, you got a special syntax for uh, unit returning functions, but actually it might be deprecated in, the, in one of the up and coming uh, Scala versions, so I'm not showing it to you. Instead, I'm just telling you that you need to specify that this function returns unit and acts like it's just a, a normal function. And that will just show the result of an, uh, of an int into a string that tell, says, that prints the function called, basically. You can also declare some anonymous function. I've, I've shown you in a previous slide, in that case, that it's, I've just declared a function taking two parameters and do, uh, implementing basically multiply, but just as an anonymous function here. And also, uh, you can pass a function to another function, so I, other, I other function, like you might, might use LRE in Python. In that case, that function, uh, its second parameter is a function taking an int and returning an int. Uh, print an int, in that case, it returns unit, so I guess it will infer a unit, but still, it's, well, I think it's a best practice to actually specify that it's a unit returning function, from my point of view personally, but that, and, and I see most of the code I've written in Scala uses that procedural syntax that might be deprecated in the next following versions. <laughs> I've kind of learned this in the last year, so I'm starting, starting to try to convert it to more uh, of, uh, explicitly unit uh, returning types, but yeah. Okay. It's, it's as you want in that case. And obviously it's an object-oriented uh, language, so you've got classes. And uh, uh, that's a specific, special case of a single data object. Basically, uh, you, well, you've got abstract classes, which are classes you can't create an instance of it yet. You've got a, a basic classes that ex extends your abstract class and that re refines that uh, function that wasn't defined in the previous class. And that single data object is basically a class that can only be one instance of like the, sing the singleton pattern can also use it to create a singleton object of the same name as, as a class. That's basically the equivalence of a static method or the static keyword in Java. So you can, uh, well, that's actually, actually a typo. It should be a, a capital B here, but you can call that function using its, uh, its class name, then its uh, function name from that uh, singleton object. And let's, let's, let's go back into some more familiar code to compare uh, what I think is similar between Python and Scala. Well, first, uh, the collections in Python uh, are, can be we pretty much mapped one to one, one to some collections in Scala. I just put a list, tuple, uh, set, and dictionary here. Uh, everybody familiar with these uh, uh, collections in Python? Yeah, so I think I can continue to the Scala equivalent. Uh, I replaced a list by a sequence, which is basically the root of all the sequence-like uh, uh, collections in Scala. You've got a, a single, single type linked list, which is basically constructed with using these colon, colon uh, stuff that we'll see, see later, but that's not important. That's just the return type of, of that list. You've got a tuple, which isn't a collection in Scala because it's completely immutable. So when you're creating a tuple, you can't change them. So, and all of these tuple types are pretty different. So they don't really behave as a collection. That can be a cat in some case, but you're, I'm, you're not using tuples most of the time, so I don't think that's a big problem. Uh, sets act, act like, as, as I said, like sequences, they have many up, different implementations. And a map acts like a map. It's construction using these arrows was basically uh, allows you to create these maps. And all of these collections comes in, uh, by default in an immutable implementation, but you can also use a mutable implementation if you specify it ex explicitly. If I can continue with some list comprehension in Python, uh, I, I, pretty much everybody is familiar with them. So ba basically, uh, in, in Scalar, you don't have list comprehension, you have for comprehension. Which is, if, if we go in depth in them, they're closer to like uh, do notation in Haskell. But for, for, for the sake of this presentation, they, like, let's just say that they act uh, on collection, they act just like a list comprehension in uh, Python. So in that case, it's just a simple list comprehension uh, iterating thing from one to three and yielding the, the, uh, the results multiplied by, by themselves. Here we've got a 
uh, uh, a list of all the uh, numbers from 1 to 10 that are multiples of 3. And here we've got a, a, a list of tuples of numbers between 1 and 5 that when ad added together gives you 5. Just some quick examples. Uh, you can put it on one line like this. You can, uh, can separate some clothes with uh, some uh, semicolons. Or you can use braces and put them on multiple lines. That's just uh, an implementation detail. Uh, yeah, I think. Any questions for this? And also, well, most of the time, there these uh, functions are, are backed by uh, functional programming uh, f functions like you can see here in Python. Uh, anybody not familiar with them here? Or so I think that's uh, that's good. And in uh, Scala, since it tries, since their collection and they try to be object oriented, the like map filter combinations will be found directly on these collections and will take an anonymous function directly instead of taking a, a collection and an anonymous function. So in that case, uh, another thing I, I must say, uh, here I'm, I'm giving an implicit parameter to my anonymous function. So instead of saying that this function takes a parameter named x and return x times x, if the, your parameter is only used one in your, once in your function, you can just replace it by an underscore, which is often used for implicitly uh, Implicit stuff, it's like here, there's, it's just an implicit parameter, so you don't need to specify that it's named x. It will be inferred by the compiler. And also, uh, if, if you compare the Python implementation for some S5, I have used a combination function from iter tools. There's an equivalent in uh, Scala, but if you want to be formal, what the for comprehension is actually doing, it's calling a flat map, which is uh, basically a map followed by a flatten for uh, on collections. So like if you start from a list of lists of some, some type, you'll end up with a list of that particular type. Without all of these elements will be flattened in the same list. Obviously, there are some distinctions because since there are different languages and uh, static typing is not the only distinction. First, it supports uh, pattern matching, which in the beginning can look like a switch statement like you see in languages like C, Java, C, C Sharp, et cetera. Uh, so basically, uh, you're just using your variable with the keyword mats and telling your different cases. So if, if you, you receive a, a value that of zero, it's, you, you print, I, I'm printing zero. If I receive a, an n that's, uh, actually there's a typo here, I need to put n here. I forget, if n is, is smaller than zero, then it's negative. And as a default case, it will be positive. I'll fix that typo on my, it's not, my slides on my, on my GitHub repo, so I'll try to send a link. Any questions? <laughs>